Okay, so I should say at the beginning that it's possibly a bit of a rambling paper across kind of various um, gaps, say, in the historiography of the <coughs> early history of the plantation. Okay. So a few years ago saw the 400th anniversary of the inception of the Ulster Plantation. Generally speaking, the occasion passed by without a great deal of published output, recon reconsidering what must surely rank as one of the most significant initiatives ever undertaken in Ireland. This, one must assume, was perhaps owing to a belief that the history of the plantation in its infancy, during the reigns of James I and Charles I, has largely been determined by the studies produced by T.W. Moody, R.J. Hunter, Philip Robinson, John Johnston, Michael Percival Maxwell, Nicholas Kenny, and Raymond Gillespie, among others. Moreover, the lack of new work on the Ulster Plantation could also be attributed to a belief that the often patchy source material for the period has been mined as effectively as it can be. I don't wish in this paper today to take exception to the work of any of those historians mentioned, but rather to suggest that accomplished as many of the works produced over the years on the settlement of Ulster in the first half of the 17th century have been, there remain many gaps, some extensive, in our knowledge of the plantation, and also a wide array of archival collections, which have barely been touched upon by historians of the period. As such, what follows examines a number of areas in which there is an opportunity to expand our knowledge of the early history of the Ulster Plantation, and offers some tentative remarks on a few of these topics. Okay, so just to provide a little bit of context, I'll overview how the Ulster Plantation was arranged. I'm sure this will be familiar to most of you, but just for the sake of context. Each county was divided into precincts, generally coterminous with modern-day baronies. Individual precincts were allotted to different classes of grantees. So some, such as Boylock and Banna in Donegal, which I'll say more on in a minute, were assigned to Scottish undertakers. Others, such as Oma and Tyrone, were allotted to English undertakers. And others, such as Tully Hall and Cavan, were assigned to a mixture of servitors or English officials in Ireland and native Irish. These precincts in turn were divided into proportions. There were three types of proportions, great proportions consisting of 2,000 acres, middle proportions consisting of 1,500 acres, and small proportions consisting of 1,000 acres. Each grantee was given their lands on the basis that they were to fulfil certain obligations enshrined in the orders and conditions, um, published in London in January 1609, and the project of plantation drawn up in 1610 and on which the plantation was largely grounded. Thus, religious conformity was to be ensured by having the undertaker and his principal tenants attend services and take the oath of supremacy. <coughs> the defence of the granted lands was to be seen to by building a bone or defensive structure on each proportion with a castle or stone house within, while both the undertaker and his tenants were to keep arms and weapons for their protection. To ensure a planter society emerged, English and Scottish undertakers were to bring settlers from England and lowland Scotland and were to expel the Irish from their lands, though the servitors could re retain Irish tenants. Each 1,000 acres was to be planted with at least 24 British adult males comprised of at least 10 families. These British tenants were to live in nucleated settlements around castle and bones which the undertakers would construct. Strict deadlines were were laid down for meeting these requirements. The grantees were to have built their bone and castle within two years of receiving their lands and were to have made substantial inroads towards <coughs> settling them with British tenants, although this grace period was quickly extended to three years. So this, broadly speaking, was how the plantation was arranged. Generally speaking, studies of the Ulster plantation have been region-specific. Many years ago, T.W. Moody began this pattern with a study of the London Dairy Plantation. In the 1960s, R.J. Hunter conducted what is still probably the finest work to have been conducted on the plantation to this day, when he systematically studied the plantation in Armagh and Cavan for a dissertation which curiously was only awarded an M. Late at Trinity College, Dublin. John Johnston and Philip Robinson surveyed the plantation in Fermanagh and Tyrone, respectively, in their dis dissertations completed at, here at Queen's in the 1970s, while many articles have been written on the course of the plantation in specific regions or even on specific estates. Yet for all the quality of this work, there are still considerable gaps in our knowledge of certain regions. So one such is Donegal. Um, there's a map of how it broke down. I, I stole this map um, from, from somewhere else. Um, so I apologise, it's a little bit old. Um, 
The most significant work on this to date was an extensive article thereon by Hunter, published in 1995 in the Donegal volume of the History and Society series. Yet while that article was a significant contribution, it was primarily a case study of the precinct of Lifford in the south of the barony of Rafoe, which was granted to a number of English undertakers. As such, there remains much work to be done on the lands granted to Scottish undertakers in the precincts of Port Portlock and of Boylock and Bannon, the lands granted to the servitors in the precinct of Kilmacrinan or Doe and Fannet, as it was variously referred to, and the lands in the barony of Tirhugh in the south of the county, a curious precinct variously divided between the Church of Ireland, Trinity College Dublin, and lands to support the forts and towns and the free school in the region. So there was a free school in each county. So I'll speak briefly about one of these as an example, uh, that of the precinct of Boylock and Bannon, where the plant plantation progressed in a highly unusual fashion. The 10,000 acres here were allotted to eight Scottish grantees. So this is just a breakdown of them. Uh, Sir Robert McClelland, the Laird of Bombay, uh, George Murray, L Lord Broughton, William Stewart, Sir Patrick McPhee, James Cullock, Alexander Dunbar, Patrick Vaux and Alexander Cunningham all generally hailing from Wigtonshire, Kirkwood, Brightshire and Ayrshire in the western Scottish lowlands. The first years of the plantation saw several of the grantees briefly visit their allotments before returning to Scotland. Indeed, in his survey of the plantation conducted in 1611, George Carew, the former Lord President of Munster and a major figure in the English suppression of the Nine Years' War, reported that little had been done to begin settling British tenants or building the required settlements by the grantees here other than to appoint agents to represent them in their absence. Yet this was not uncommon across the six planted counties at this early stage in the plantation. More worrying was the report following from Josiah's Bodley's inspection of the plantation in 1613. <coughs> the report on Boylock and Banna stands out in the way Bodley presented it. He began by noting that not one of the eight grantees met with him there or sent an agent to represent them. Of the building progress, Bodley simply reported that Sir Patrick McPhee had constructed a house on his proportion at Cargy, measuring some 30 tree by 18 foot and two storeys high. It had no bone cast about it, but rather a ditch of sods of earth was being made. This rather dismal showing was apparently the only tangible building work achieved by the eight grantees across the precinct after four years. The loss of the reports following from further surveys conducted by Bodley in 1614 and 1616 unfortunately means that we cannot track the progress of the eight grantees here during the mid 16 teens in any detail. However, it must have been negligible, for at some stage in 1618, John Murray, favourite of King James I and the Keeper of the Privy Purse, and from 1622, Viscount Annan, and from 1624, the First Earl of Annandale was appointed as an overseer of the entire 10,000 acres of land in the precinct. Certainly from a defensive viewpoint some change was necessary. A muster of the provinces of Ulster was conducted by George Allen in 1618. Uh, not a single man was mustered throughout the entire precinct in Boyle and Bannon. Moreover, when reporting on the barony shortly after Murray's superintendency began in 1619, Nicholas Penner stated that a house and bone had been built on, eight, on six of the eight proportions, though at least one of these would appear to have been a pre-plantation structure. Yet even this slightly more positive report was followed just a few years later with a more sobering account produced by Richard Hadser and Thomas Phillips as part of their survey of the plantation in Donegal and Londonderry, produced as part of the 1622 Commission into Irish Affairs. Murray was formally granted the entire 10,000 acres in the precinct in 1620, in what was a gross breach by the king himself of the project for plantation stipulation that no grantee should receive more than 3,000 acres. Being a major landholder in Scotland and court figure, Murray was absent from Donegal but had appointed an agent, one Herbert Maxwell. Maxwell's progress in implementing the plantation strictures throughout the precinct was admittedly scant. For instance, of the largest proportion there called the Rosses, consisting of 2,000 acres in the west of the barony, Hadser and Phillips noted there was still nothing built and no British tenants. The second biggest proportion, Boylock Atra, consisting of 1,500 acres, was performing slightly better. There was nothing built here, but there was one family of British settlers. Although pro progress was better in some of the other proportions, 
Hadser and Phillips were deeply critical of Maxwell's efforts to establish the states of freehold and leasehold to British settlers, and also noted the almost utter lack of arms for defence across the precinct. Okay. So into the late 1620s, Annandale farmed out much of the lands to George Hamilton, though this was only a brief experiment and an agent was back representing the Earl within a few years. Despite this lack of progress, when regrants of estates were made across the six planted counties in the late 1620s and early 1630s, Murray was yet again granted the, the, the 10,000 acres. Um, we don't have the data available to us for the 16 teens and early 1620s through surveys for the late 16, mid to late 1620s, um, on which I'll say a bit more in a minute. But nevertheless, other sources suggest that Annandale and his agents on the ground in Boylock and Banna had made little further progress. Okay. So, for instance, when all able British men were being mustered across Ulster in 1630, just 143 appeared to the muster for the precinct. So there should have been um, 240 according to the, the stipulations in the plantation um, articles. Uh, comparative to other regions, this suggests a strikingly low level of British settlement in this part of Donegal, certainly drastically below what had been envisioned by colonial theorists and the planners of the plantation. Indeed, from a defensive perspective, the situation was far more worse. At this muster, it was determined that these 143 settlers had just four swords and one gun between them for their defence. <coughs> Moreover, during the 1630s, there are reports which make clear that while some British settlement had occurred, particularly in the vicinity of the town of Killy Beggs, the precinct was still overwhelmingly inhabited by Irish tenants. Thus we have here a situation where the Crown's efforts to effectively implement the terms of the plantation ran completely aground. First, the original grantees were not well selected, and with one or two token exceptions were very slow in fulfilling any of their obligations in Donegal many of them being absent in Scotland. Secondly, the decision was taken to effectively confiscate the whole precinct owing to the negligence of the original grantees and to assign it to John Murray. Yet the decision to grant the lands to a court favourite and one who would assuredly be absent in England or Scotland was highly questionable and led to the fitful employment of, of agents to administer the estate who made little headway. Yet despite these years of fitful progress over the 1620s, Murray was regranted the entire precinct in 1629. Thus, both James I and Charles I unwittingly undermined any efforts to effectively implement the plantation theory in this particular precinct. Um, it's not just Donegal that there are regions where there remains much to be examined in respect of the plantation in its infancy. Tyrone has been studied by Philip Robinson in his doctoral thesis completed here at Queen's in 1974. While Robinson's work was groundbreaking, his approach was that of a historical geographer, and his emphasis was more on the movement of people rather than the na nature of the plantation they actually created. Moreover, as his work covered a period well beyond 1641, and in actuality looked well beyond the confines of the county of Tyrone, much of the minutiae of the plantation within the county itself was not included in his thesis. As such, there is much to be determined about how the plantation proceeded here. Okay, so again, I'll just take one example, um, specifically the precinct of Oma, which was allocated for English undertakers. Like with Boylock and Banna in Donegal, the manner in which the plantation developed in Oma was highly unusual. During the plan planning stage of the plantation in the summer of 1609, George Tiché, Lord Audley, and future First Earl of Castlehaven had submitted a wildly ambitious plan to the government. In this, he requested 100,000 acres of land either in Tyrone or Armagh, which he intended to divide into 33 parts, on each of which he would construct a castle and a barn, and a town, sorry. To each of these he would apportion 600 and 2400 acres respectively, which would support 30 families comprising foot soldiers, artificers and cottagers. Of the towns, six were to be market towns with one corporate town, while provision was also made to develop iron, glass and wood industries in the county. Audley's scheme was out of touch with the concerns for grants of lands to be small, but his proposal did lead to him being given a major allotment when lands were granted, 
In March 1611, Audley and his wider family were effectively granted the entire precinct of Omagh and Tyrone, comprising 11,000 acres, or you know, what, what would effectively be in the region of about 70 or 80,000 statute acres in today's terms. So this is the, the breakdown. Of these, Audley himself took the two proportions of Finnick and Rarone, comprising 3,000 acres. His two sons, Mervyn and Ferdinand, were each granted 2,000 acres, while his son-in-law, Sir Edward Blunt, also received 2,000 acres. The final 2,000 acres had already been granted the previous summer to Sir John Davies, the Attorney General of Ireland, and another son-in-law of Audley's. Thus, the arrangement in Omagh was highly unusual in that an entire precinct was granted in totality to an extended family. Now, the plantation proposal Audley made in 1609 is relatively well known, but what is less so is the subsequent fortunes of the lands he and his family were granted in Tyrone. Given the late date of the grant of the Touches, it is wholly understandable that George Carew, George Carew found nothing done in 1611. However, two years later, when Bodley visited, this largely remained the case. Audley was reported as living there, but nothing had been done to begin building or settling tenants, and the precinct was still wholly inhabited by the Irish of the region. Remarkably, the situation still largely prevailed a half a decade later, when Nicholas Penner reported on the precinct, a few years after Audley's own death in 1616. The exception was on Davies' proportion, where two houses had apparently been built, but neither of these had a bone about them. Of the other 9,000 acres, apparently no building works were progressing. Some British settlers were living there, yet a rent roll which was shown to Penner by the second Earl of Castlehaven's agent there showed that of the 64 British tenants listed, the terms of their estates were so unsure that they were actually leaving Oma. Uh, presumably to return to England or Scotland or possibly to seek better terms um, on other estates throughout Ulster. The rest of the barony, Penner noted, was led to some 20 Irish tenants who must have held sizeable estates. There were allegedly 3,000 other Irish living under them on these lands. But by 1619, thus by 1619, the Audleys, who had proposed a wildly ambitious scheme to plant almost a quarter of the land available in the six counties, had generally failed in almost every conceivable way to plant the 11,000 acres which they were eventually granted. The 1620s saw significant changes in ownership. Shortly after Penner's visit, Sir Henry Mervyn, the second Earl of Castlehaven's brother-in-law, obtained the 6,000 acres that had originally been granted to Audley's two sons and Edward Blunt. Davies retained control of his 2,000 acres, while the 3,000 acres originally granted to Audley were now held by his widow, who had remarried to Sir Piers Crosby, um, an anglicised O'Crossan from the Midlands. These were holding the land in trust for James Touche, son and heir of the second Earl of Castlehaven. When the commissioners visited the precinct in 1622, they found little further done. Mervyn had not built on his 6,000 acres, and those lands were all virtually inhabited with Irish tenants. Things were slightly sunnier from a plantation theory point of view over on Davies' proportion, and the original Audley lands now occupied by the Countess of Castlehaven and Piers Crosby. Some further British tenants had been brought in on these, though there was little progress in building anything. However, somewhat worryingly from the perspective of an, of an English state constantly fearful of war with Habsburg Spain in the 1620s, a local mas malcontent, one Daniel Lay, reported that the agent who had delivered Crosby's certificate, Francis Lucas, was a papist who had served both Philip III of Spain and the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. Whatever the truth of this latter assertion, the point is that the development of the plantation in this precinct was yet again regard retarded by the utter complacency of the grantees and subsequent holders of those lands. Yet the Crown did not intervene. In 1630, Piers Crosby and James Mervyn, son of... Henry Mervyn, were regranted all of their estates in Oma, although admittedly some progress had been made in the 1620s. Nevertheless, this was around the same time that Musters, so the same Musters that I've referred to in uh, Boyle and Bannon, were being taken throughout Ulster to assess the defensive capabilities of the plantation. Though nowhere near as bad as the situation in Boyle and Bannon, the limited number of British settlers in Oma were poorly prepared to defend themselves, 
on lands which were still largely populated by Irish natives. This was exactly the situation the Crown had sought to prevent in 1609, and by granting an entire barony wholesale to one family, it ensured that these conditions prevailed throughout a substantial block of the planted lands in Tyrone. Okay. So, Donegal and Tyrone are far from the only regions of the six officially planted counties for which we lack detailed studies. Because of the central role of the London livery companies in planting London Derry, there is an unusually high level of documentation available for the study of the plantation in this particular region of Ulster. While the witch hunt which the servitor and founder of Limavady, Sir Thomas Phillips, waged against the London companies throughout the 1620s, generated a range of reports which shed light on developments there. Um, much of this has been utilised from T.W. Moody's pioneering work on the Londonderry Plantation onwards, and it is probably fair to say that we have a largely comprehensive understanding of how the companies were initially pulled reluctantly into involvement in Londonderry, of how the plantation there broadly speaking evolved, and in particular of the development of the two towns of Derry and Colerain. However, the two towns were just the focal points in a plantation of what was adjudged at the time to be roughly 70,000 acres of land that we would now understand it to equate to just over a half a million statute acres. Of this broad expanse, each of the 12 major London livery companies was granted an estate deemed to consist of 3,200 acres each, though these estates in actuality ranged from 20 to 30,000 statute acres. So here's kind of a breakdown. Um, While well, the establishment of Derry and Coleraine was jointly invested in by the 12 companies through the Irish Society, um, established to administer the, sa- the same, these individual allotments were the sole responsibility of the company to which they were granted, and each was responsible for the development thereof. By the late 16-teens, every company except the Mercers had far- farmed out their lands to land speculators in Ireland, but the company's records still provide extensive details on how they developed. Accordingly, some studies of the individual holdings have been conducted, uh, notably by uh, R.J. Hunter on the lands of the Fishmongers Company, by Nicholas Canney in Making Ireland British on the Haberdashers and the Ironmongers, and by Audrey Horning on the lands of the Mercers. However, of the other companies and how they settled their lands, there is at present virtually nothing known. Uh, The records are there. I'll take just one example briefly today. Uh, that of the Draper's Company, whose extensive Irish papers at Prony contain sizable early 17th century estate records, from which a picture of the settlement there can be developed. The Drapers maintained direct control of their proportion until 1619, when it was eventually farmed out to Sir Thomas Roper on a 55-year lease, with an entry fine of £450 and paying £230 rent per annum. This arrangement, however, did not last long, and in 1622, the Drapers resumed direct control of the allotment through an agent, uh, Robert Harrington, a situation which again only prevailed until 1628, when the company again farmed the land to Peter Baker. Baker's death in 1631 led to a temporary resumption of direct control before the lands were let for a third time in 1632, this time to Sir John Clotworthy. Thus, although the company actively pursued a policy of farming out the lands, it still ended up administering uh, the proportion directly for much of the period prior to 1635, when the Londoners were prosecuted by Charles I in Star Chamber, following which trial their lands were confiscated by the Crown. So, amongst the papers at Prony are extensive estate records showing the development of the main settlement of Drapertown or Moneymore. Um, on which I'll say a little bit more later when I go into the towns and the Ulster plantation. And rentals and other details of leases showing how the lands were settled. Generally these indicate that the fortunes of the lands here were often dependent upon who the proportion was being farmed out to or managed by on behalf of the company. For instance, in the early 16-teens when the livery company's general representative in Ulster, John Rowley, still had oversight here. The lands were seen to have been poorly managed, with Rowley's foremost concern being his own personal gain. As late as the mid-1620s, the tenants here were complaining that their lands had been, that their rents had been set extortionately high by Rowley, and the terms of their estate were somewhat unsure. 
However, Harrington seems to have been assiduous in his management of the proportion, and they requested that he be kept in place and new terms to be negotiated with the tenants. The Draper's Company lands are just one of, the, one of a number of the 12 livery companies' estates for which there is a considerable opportunity to shed further light on developments. Um, so I'm going to wander slightly outside of the six officially planted counties for the next section. Arguably, arguably the greatest black spot in terms of the plantation of Ulster in the 17th century is the county of Monaghan. Of the three counties in the province not officially planted in 1609, Antrim and Down have been the subjects of extensive studies by, among others, Michael Percival Maxwell, Raymond Gillespie and Jane Almer. In contrast, Monaghan has been virtually ignored. The only major work thereon having been conducted by P.J. Duffy, who in a series of articles published in the 1980s, has established the ways in which land ownership changed in the province in the decades prior to 1641. Yet there is still a striking lack of detail on the specifics of the plantation there. This, I suspect, is only to a mistaken belief that there is a lack of sources for investigating settlement patterns in the counties, in the county, predicated on the fact that the county was generally not included in any of the surveys and musters taken of the province by George Carew in 1611, Bodley in 1619, 16, 1613, 1614 and 1616, uh, George Allen in 1618, Penner in 1619 and Commissioners for Irish Causes in 1622. While this is certainly an impediment, it is largely overcome by estate records. Monaghan is one of the best documented counties in early Stuart Ulster in this respect. Foremost here are the extensive Barrett Leonard monuments housed at Essex County Records Office. These cover much of the lands obtained by the Loftus family in the county and contain records pertaining to those lands prior to their acquisition of them. Particular gems are two volumes of rentals covering 1637, 1638 and 1640 and a further volume comprising 103 leases made from 1587 onwards. Elsewhere in Prony we have the Eli Papers, the Farney Papers and the Madden Papers all of which shed considerable light on developments in early modern mono. That we have all of these papers is fortunate, for the manner in which Monaghan was planted is wholly unusual and contrasts sharply with the rest of the province. While six of the counties were officially planted in 1609, the two counties of East Ulster were largely colonised by entrepreneurial Scottish planters such as the Montgomerys and the Hamiltons, along with the Macdonald Earl, Earls of Antrim from 1603 onwards. The settlement of Monaghan, by way of contrast, predates the Nine Years' War. In the late 1580s, the serving Irish Viceroy, William Fitzwilliam, began an aggressive strategy of intervention in Ulster, whereby the existing lordships were to be broken up and divided amongst the extended septs and English planters. The experiment was begun in Monaghan, where the head of the MacMahons, Sir Ross MacMahon, had recently died. His successor, Hugh Rowe MacMahon, was ex executed in 1590, following fractious negotiations with the Crown. Following this, the Solicitor General, Roger Wilbraham, organised a settlement whereby the Lordship was broken up amongst numerous heads of the MacMahons and other Irish of the region, while English placemen were introduced to key locations such as Clonas. So, it's kind of a rough idea of the, the breakdown in 1591. <coughs> um, in many respects it was efforts to extend this settlement further north into Fermanagh with the ultimate goal of doing so in Tyrone and Tyrconnell which precipitated the Nine Years' War the outbreak of that conflict saw Fitzwilliam's strategy remain largely stillborn however the process was far enough along in Monaghan that when James I and his advisors set about planting Ulster from 1607 onwards the decision was taken to exempt Monaghan from the official plantation. As such, it developed independently. So, most significantly, it's the only specimen we have of how things might have developed more generally in Ulster had Fitzwilliam's strategy of the 1590s been successfully applied elsewhere. As such, a comprehensive study of the plantation of the county in the first half of the 17th century would be interesting not just from the perspective of plantation studies, but also for those examining policy formation in late Elizabethan Ireland. Just as there are significant gaps in our knowledge of certain districts of the plantation, 
there remains a substantial deficit of information on some of the urban settlements. Generally speaking, studies of the development of towns in the plantation has tended to focus on the bigger settlements, notably Derry, Coleraine, Strabane and Armagh, and the intended borough towns, particularly those that were incorporated such as Inneskin, uh, Donegal and Dungan. What remains relatively underdeveloped is our understanding of smaller urban settlements and large, what we call large villages, I suppose. Um, particularly those which are not planned in 1609-1610, but developed either as a, as a result of the initiative of an individual undertaker or basically evolved spontaneously. So I'll just take a few examples of these. One was Pierce Court on the proportion of Kennet and Cashel in Loch T and Cavan, originally granted to Esme Stewart, Lord Albany. These lands moved hands several times in the 1610s and 1620s, with them passing first to Sir James Hamilton and then to Sir Henry Piers. The origins of the town were in an impressive bone and castle built originally by Albany and Ham Hamilton. Castle Albany, as it was referred to at the time, eclipsed most of those built in Ulster in the first half of the 17th century, being five storeys high with four, four round flank towers as flankers and a gate and gatehouse of freestone, above which the king's arms were emblazoned. <coughs> Such a strong defensive structure no doubt encouraged nearby settlement, while it was also noted at the time that it, ha that it had been erected at a meeting point of a number of natural highways of the region. Thus, by the late 1620s, a town of some 20 houses had emerged next to the castle, though there is a frustrating lack of details on what other urban development may have occurred beyond the actual number <coughs> of houses that were there. <coughs> One of the biggest settlements to emerge organically was Letter Kinney. This was settled on the proportion of Ballyrahan Bally and Letterkenny granted to the servitor Patrick Crawford in the precinct of Kilmacrennan or Doe and Fanad. Crawford did almost nothing to develop his lands prior to his death at the siege of the castle of Dooney Veg on Isla in 1616. However, his widow quickly remarried to Sir George Malbury, and under Malbury's direction the town quickly emerged. By 1619, Malbury had erected a bone next to which the town was growing rapid, rapidly. Nicholas Penner, in his report on Mulberry's land, described the settlement as consisting of 40 houses. It was expressly noted that these were British settlers and clearly consisted largely of families as they were able to muster an arm over 50 men. Three years later, the settlement had further expanded to 50 houses, a substantial proportion of which were described as being built of stone. The presence of a water mill and the description of the town as a market town further attest to considerable urban development here in the late 16-teens and early 1620s. In the adjoining county of Londonderry, mid-sized nucleated settlements were also emerging on the proportions of each of the 12 livery companies. Uh, one such was Draperstown or Moneymore on the proportion of the Drapers Company. By the early 1620s, the farmer of the proportion, Sir Thomas Roper, had re-edified a pre-existing church there, as well as constructing a bawn and castle. A village of around a dozen houses had been settled, of which about half were built of stone and half of timber, and of which Penner commented in 1619 that they were the best that he had seen in the entire county of Londonderry. Moreover, a water mill and a malt house had been built, and a waterworks put in place to channel water to the village from a site about a mile away from the settlement. However, not everything was rosy here. When the Drapers resumed direct control of the lands from Roper in 1622, their newly appointed agent Robert Harrington and his deputy Robert Goodwin reported, so this is an image of the actual report, reported that much of the building work had been allowed to decay and that the invest and that investment was needed to complete the bond and castle <coughs> and to repair the church. Moreover, in 1625, the leading inhabitants of the town petitioned the company directly for a reduction in their rents if the waterworks was not properly maintained and if the streets between houses were not paved in some fashion, claiming that in winter it was difficult to travel from house to house in the mud. Despite these impediments, plans were in progress to acquire a licence to hold markets and fairs there and the inhabitants also petitioned the company to further this suit. So just as the planners of the plantation had made provision for towns and urban settlements to emerge in the planted regions, 
so too they anticipated the need for civic development, particularly so in the case of education. It was enshrined in the Articles of Plantation that one free school would be established in each of the six counties, and several hundred acres were allotted to their use to fund the said institutions. However, far more substantial was the allocation of lands towards Ireland's recently established university. Extensive lands totalling some 50,000 statute acres across the six counties were secured for the newly established Trinity College Dublin in 1610 through the intervention of two prominent Scottish courtiers, James Hamilton and James Fullerton, um, both figures who had been prominent in the actual establishment of the college in 1591. Okay, so these lands were <coughs> primarily located in two distinct blocks in the county of Armagh and the barony of Tyr Hugh, which as previously seen was in South Donegal. Though there was also a small bit of land in Fermanagh and 19 advowsons um, allotted to Trinity across the six counties. Thus the lands granted to Trinity constituted a substantial block of lands in plantation near Ulster. However, these present more of a problem than anything else to the historian. Early on in proceedings, the college elected to farm out its holdings to middlemen in a course similar to that being followed by the London companies in London Derry. However, unlike the London companies, Trinity quickly managed to acquire an exemption from some of the requirements imposed on plantation grantees, most notably that which precluded them from taking on Irish tenants. As such, in the decades that followed, there was little scrutiny of the college's lands and conditions there. Given this, so basically, I mean, there, there's, there's no um, account of any of Trinity's lands in any of the surveys that were conducted in the 1610s or 1620s. <coughs> Given this, while the Trinity mon monuments provide considerable information on the specifics of how the college leased out the lands that was granted in Ulster to middlemen or farmers, <coughs> there is a frustrating lack of information on the under tenants there. These, these middlemen in turn let the lands tow and the actual conditions on the ground are. Nevertheless, despite these considerable impediments, there is clearly much that can be done to gain a greater insight into Trinity's lands in Ulster. In particular, while one of the two major blocks of lands, that in Armagh, was studied in detail by R.J. Hunter, the other major block of land in Tier Hugh in Donegal has not been examined in detail and warrants considerable further investigation. There is, however, an issue which, imp which impedes exploration of almost all of these geographical regions and issues. It is without doubt that the greatest problem that confronts the historian of the early Ulster plantation is a lack of detailed sources for the 1630s. So, for the reign of James I, we have complete surveys of the plantation, as I've mentioned, by Carew in 1611, Bodley in 1613, Penner in 1619 and the Commission for Irish Affairs in 1622. We also have fragments of a further survey by Bodley in 1614 and a muster of the province taken by George Allen in 1618. These provide extensive details on how the grantees had developed their lands, what they had built, what towns and villages had come into being, what economic activity was being practised and what the defensive capabilities of the settlers were while also being our best sources for extrapolating the total British population of a given region at a given time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, though, no such surveys exist for the reign of Charles I. The only ma major sources of a similar kind were a muster of the province taken around 1630 and a slew of inquisi inquisitions taken throughout Ulster between, generally between 1629 and 1631. While these are useful, they are nowhere near as comprehensive as the surveys James ordered during his lifetime. In any event, they deal only with the first six or seven years of Charles's reign. This means that we have virtually no systematic record of how the plantation developed in the 1630s. Historians, in trying to confront this problem, have turned to later documentation and attempted to read this backwards in order to inform us as to what might have happened at this time. Examples of these records include the Down Survey of the 1650s, the Census of 1659 and the Books of Survey and Distribution. Yet there are significant problems with this approach. The idea that information about the 1630s can be read accurately backwards from records produced during the 15, 1650s and 1660s is hazardous given the, the massive amount of social, economic and 
demographic dislocation that occurred throughout Ireland in the 1640s and 1650s. But there are other ways to overcome the lack of records for the 1630s. So, for starters, the records that are there need to be examined, even when they are located in obscure archives. For instance, in Buckinghamshire Records Centre, amongst the Basel manuscripts, there are documents relating to a sale of the precincts of Tonaforis and Dromore and Lorga in the precinct of Lifford and Donegal, from Robert Harrington to Martin Basel in 1637. So, this isn't from the main articles, this is a schedule that's annexed. Uh, the schedule provides details of over 50 of the tenants and the lands that they held, and reveals that Harrington had generally corralled his Irish tenants into one location, with, with British settlers exclusively occupying other portions. As such, this is an extremely valuable document for establishing the pattern of landholding in Donegal on the eve of the 1641 rebellion. Yet it is not featured in previous studies. Other documents can be used more imaginatively. Clearly the 1641 depositions can do much to inform us about conditions prevailing throughout the six planted counties in the 1630s. So this is fairly well established. Equally, while the record made in 1639 of the settlers in London Derry by commission from King Charles I and known as the Great Parchment Book was unfortunately very badly damaged in the fire at the Guildhall in London in 1786 but a large 35, vo 35 folio volume amongst the state papers may act as a substitute for the Parchment Book so this is just the first page of it uh, these were two accounts drawn up by Robert Whitfield and Charles Reed on the whole of the London Derry Plantation in 1641 before the outbreak of the rebellion. It has been spe speculated that the arrangement of tenants and other details in this may have been based on the parchment book and that as such Whitfield's account may be of use in reconstructing one of the most significant estate records drawn up in the 1630s. There are many other examples of how the problem created by the lack of systematic surveys for the 1630s can be substantially overcome. Okay, so just to deal with one other issue and what's in a fairly rambling paper. Um, specifically, the mechanisms whereby settlement actually occurred in Ulster in the first three decades of the plantation. So, the idea of colonial spread has largely become accepted in the historiography, uh, argued for by Robinson and Percival Maxwell, and also to a degree by Gillespie and Kenny. <coughs> These historians have argued that settlement patterns up to 1641 were primarily influenced by English and more notably Scottish settlers arriving to entry points such as the port towns of Derry and Coleraine and Belfast and Carrickfergus in East, in East Ulster, from which they moved inland and migrated to estates depending on where the best opportunities in terms of lands and rents were available. While there's little doubt in that this was the most significant factor in how Ulster settler society evolved in different locales, the point may have been over-argued insofar as landlord-led migration from England and Scotland to specific proportions was also a significant factor, particularly so in the early years of the plantation, so largely in the 16-teens and the early 1620s, I would argue. Okay. Um, it's easier to distinguish this in those cases where the undertaker was resoundingly unsuccessful in establishing British settlers on their lands, as this was effectively landlord-led failure to plant lands with British tenants. It is more difficult in terms of successfully planted regions, but some remarks can be made. Surely the foremost example of successful landlord-led settlement is the estate of the Earls of Abercorn in the precinct of Strabane in Tyrone. James Hamilton, 1st Earl of Abercorn, was granted the great proportion of Duna Long, consisting of 2,000 acres, and a proportion of Strabane, consisting of 1,000 acres in the original plantation grants, and quickly acquired a further 1,500 acres nearby when Sir Thomas Boyd assigned his proportion of Shane in the precinct around 1612. So this is um, just a contemporary map with Josiah's body of the proportion, or the precinct. Abercorn's uh, 4,500 acres quickly became one of the most successfully developed and settled regions of the six planted counties, and this was most certainly not owing to colonial spread, but the Earl's own efforts. 
No sooner had he been granted his lands than Abercorn was living there and overseeing extensive construction work. By the summer of 1611, a large court had been laid out in which he intended to build his castle. More importantly, Abercorn had brought over many settlers from Scotland, and already by 1611 they had established the town of Torty Houses, which would become the town of Strabane. Additionally, economic buildings were being erected, such as a brew house, and extensive building material was being prepared. Two years later, Bodley reported that there was more than 100 families of British settlers, generally drawn directly by Abercorn from Scotland, living across the Earl's 4,500 acre Strabane estate. These settlers had been estated, and Bodley noted that the Earl had already exceeded his requirements in terms of creating freeholders. By the time of Abercorn's death in 1618, he had developed the region to an extent unimaginable across most of the plantation. Not only was the region extensively settled with largely Scottish tenants, but the town of Strabane had uniquely developed with over a hundred houses and other urban buildings, including a church, sessions house, market, gwail, and a water mill, with other amenities, including a ferry, quay, and more mills nearby. <coughs> Within the six planted counties, only Derry, Coleraine and Armagh compared with it as a town. But of these, Armagh was a historical town with long roots, and Derry and Coleraine had been developed using the financial, economic and organisational power of the London livery companies. Thus, the development of the extensive Abercorn estate highlights the role that landlords could play in developing their individual allotments. Okay, so this in turn brings me to my final point. As I said at the outset, studies of the plantation have generally tended to focus on specific regions and counties, but I want to make a case here for closer scrutiny on the micro level, basically on the level of the individual proportions. In 1973, in the Scottish migration to Ulster in the reign of James I, Michael Percival Maxwell noted that, to quote, the extent and nature of the plantation differed enormously from county to county, and indeed from proportion to proportion. Much of what I've said in this paper corroborates this, whether it be the manner in which the lands granted to the Audley family in, in Oma persistently remained underdeveloped, the oscillating fortunes of the lands planted by the Drapers Company in London Derry, the thriving estates of the Earls of Abercorn in Strabane, or the manner in which the town of Letterkenny could quickly emerge under a new owner such as George Malbury. What's clear is that individual owners could have a major impact on how their estates evolved. As such, there is a need to investigate the 180 odd proportions granted to the undertakers, servitors and London companies to gain a greater insight into the face of the plantation in the years prior to 1641. It was the, these units which James I government carved the counties up into after 1609. It is perhaps how we should still approach studying them. Okay, thank you.